Okay, to keep us on time, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you. My name is Kim Tartaglia, and uh, you just heard the overview of our curriculum, and so I'm going to talk about how we've operationalized direct observation in our clinical curriculum. I'm the academic program director for part two, which is the kind of core clerkship experience in Lead, Serve, Inspire. And so that's really where my focus of my talk is going to be, those 12 months where students go into the clinical applications part of the curriculum. So certainly we've heard a lot of talks about, you know, sort of why to put an emphasis on direct observation. And for us, it was, it was sort of multifactorial. Our accrediting bodies through the LCME and the ACGME sort of have an expectation that we're going to do workplace-based assessments. And we think as we move towards a, a sort of a culture of improved patient safety and improved quality, it requires increased supervision and, and direct observation of our trainees. Um, and then as John mentioned, you know, sort of a competency-based education really hinges on sort of not using a indirect or proxy assessments of our students, but really those direct observations. Um, and certainly, you can read a lot about it, but if you've seen the JAMA 2009 meta-analysis by Jen Kogan and others, you, you know that there's a lot of tools we can use out there, and there's not a lot of validity evidence for many of them. And so, um, I'll talk to you about our process and sort of what we did um, with coming up with our tools and then sort of importing them into my progress. Um, this wasn't an initiative that started with our new curriculum. Um, we really had a, an initiative that launched back in 2010 where all of the associate clerkship directors got together to prioritize direct observation, um, trying to make sure that we could get at least students observed doing a history and physical by faculty members. And so we had a work group. Um, for the most part, we used paper-based direct observation cards that were really um, very similar to the mini CEX, I would say, with mild, mild modifications. And so that's what we were using prior to LSI. They were affectionately known to many of the students and faculty as green cards because they were on green uh, stock, uh, stock paper. Um, but certainly, I wanted to sort of just show this video because as we think about direct observation, we, we think of it as kind of a critical tool for deliberate practice. And if we want our students to achieve competency and mastery in, in certain areas, we really need to sort of promote deliberate practice, and this is one way we're going to do that. So this was actually a video uh, I did with the help of our Office of Curricular Design um, and our main campus. And so I just want to show you, it's a couple minutes long. Deliberate practice is the incorporation of structured activities designed to improve performance. And that sounds rather intuitive, but it's really that repetitive practice with observation and feedback from a coach that makes practice deliberate. Deliberate practice is a more powerful predictor of accomplishment than is experience or aptitude. Thus, innate talent is not as important as hours of deliberate practice. And I think that's great news for those of us who may not feel innately talented. Anders Ericsson has shown us that master musicians and athletes need up to 10,000 hours of deliberate practice in order to develop their expertise. And it's, it's crucial to understand that it's the quality of the practice that's as important as the quantity. In medicine, the use of deliberate practice has been associated with better performance and lower complication rates in both clinical skills as well as procedural skills. So for example, studies have shown that for central venous catheter insertion and for advanced cardiac life support, that the success rates are higher and the complication rates are lower when deliberate practice is used. It's important to know, though, that deliberate practice isn't universal among medical students or trainees, and so uh, we encourage the development of these skills early on in your training. Deliberate practice requires several elements. First and foremost, you need motivation and concentration. Then you need a set of clear objectives on what is to be accomplished, followed by focused, repetitive practice, and measurement of your performance with feedback from a coach. In the end, deliberate practice requires significant effort. In Lead, Serve, Inspire, we use direct observation of students by the faculty to ensure you're meeting your core educational objectives in professionalism, patient care, and communication. We believe that through the use of direct observation and the use of deliberate practice, that is the best way for us to help you develop your expertise. Our faculty will observe you in simulated environments, both in our clinical skills center as well as in the classroom. More importantly, faculty will observe you interacting with real patients in various clinical environments. We ask faculty to document these observations of you so that you have written feedback on the strengths of your performance as well as areas needing growth. We also ask faculty to determine whether they trust you to perform a skill without direct supervision. 
Early on in skill development, it's common to receive a not yet on this entrustment item. This is your signal that more practice is needed. As you learn the skills of patient care and communication, use the course objectives to guide what you should be learning, making sure you understand the why of it. So why am I asking this patient the particular history question? Or why do I examine the heart this way? That will help you be more focused in your practice. Once you've done it, ask for feedback. Feedback is hard to ask for, but it's such a crucial step in this process. And then go back and do it again and again and again. Each time maintain your level of focus as you continue to practice. If you're deliberate in your practice, for any skill you move from novice to advanced beginner, to competent, proficient, and finally to expert diagnostician and clinician. But don't think the learning stops there. Even faculty and experts continue to practice and get additional coaching. So I showed that as, as kind of an example of, of really how we're um, sort of explaining this and introducing this to our students as they, as they get to part two about, about the why behind it. Um, so how did we go about this? So like I said, we had an old process that um, really was many CEX focused and, and used paint cards. But as we were launching sort of part two of our, of our LSI curriculum, um, with the help of the assistant deans, we got a, the faculty leaders together and did a retreat and really sat down and said, when students are in these core clerkships, what do we want them to do? What do we expect of them at various time points in the curriculum? And so we were able to come up with a set of common core objectives in each of our sort of core competencies um, for at the assessment week, that, assessment week that's one third of the way through, at assessment week that's two thirds of the way through, and at the end of part two, where should students be with regards to patient care, communication, et cetera. And certainly not surprisingly, what came up in the retreat was that um, there were three essentially three skills that we thought that part two students should, should heavily focus on, making sure that they um, sort of achieve, achieve competency. And that was the history, the physical exam, and the, the sort of professional communication, as we call it, both kind of written documentation of a clinical encounter as well as the oral presentation. So we took those same faculty and we put together mixed groups, multidisciplinary groups that um, asked them to kind of come up with a checklist and an assessment tool that could be used in a direct observation workplace-based setting um, and it could be used across our integrated clerkships. So it didn't matter if you were on surgery or if you were on pediatrics. Um, what, what do we think good looks like as far as uh, focus history or an oral presentation? Certainly we weren't doing this sort of blind or without any other resources. We, we rely heavily on Lou Pangaro's Rhyme model here and sort of we expect students coming out of part one to essentially be a reporter. Um, and that we will have to come and verify in sort of in that workplace-based setting when they get to part two, but can they do the history and the physical? Um, and then can they start to be an interpreter, which is where we expect them to grow. And I will say that uh, John mentioned the EPAs by the AAMC, kind of those core EPAs for entering residency. When we started this work that wasn't published, it came out about six months after our retreat. And so, um, although once it did come out and we looked to say, to say what do we want to own in part two for our students, Several of them were on there and they fit really well with those core areas that our faculty had come up with. So some of the EPAs that we said in part two, students really should leave being able to do these at a competent level, include EPA one, sort of gather history, perform a physical exam. Number three, recommend and interpret common diagnostic and preventive uh, tests. Number five, document a clinical encounter. And number six, provide an oral presentation. And so they kind of aligned really well uh, with what we had come up with. So this is sort of the results of those working groups. Um, in the end, they came up with seven forms that could be used and considered as common core forms. We thought we needed two for history, one that was sort of if you were taking a comprehensive history, and one for a more focused history. We had really one physical exam form, though we knew that not many of our faculty watch a student do a head-to-toe physical exam um, because of time constraints. And so it was broken down by system, where they just had to fill out whatever systems they watched. We had one that sort of encompassed all, all types of oral presentations. And then initially we had written documentation, a focused form and a comprehensive form. But we really uh, thought that uh, for inpatient follow-up, uh, it needed its own form. So there were three for written documentation. And the integrated clerkships did decide that they needed some sort of ring-specific forms. So um, when they do their pediatrics um, and patients within populations ring, um, every student's expected to, to be directly observed doing a newborn exam. So they really wanted a form specific to that. Our neurologists felt like they needed a, a detailed neurologic exam form that was more detailed than our common core neurologic exam. 
um, because of the expectations they set in that ring. And then our surgical ring had an acute abdomen exam. And so this is an example of what it looks like in my progress. We created these forms and we sort of implemented my progress at the same time. And, and with each of these, you see that it starts off with kind of general questions, uh, greets patients in a professional manner, introduces their sel themselves and explains their role before getting on to the more details. So this is an example of our focused history form. Um, and then so it gets into the details of, you know, did they get the components of a history of present illness you'd expect them to get. All of our forms can end with the same general questions as well in overall assessment. We ask them to sort of rate the overall quality of, of this skill that they're demonstrating. And then, and then an entrustment item, which was a little, um, I think, jolting for the faculty at first. We had to ask them that based on the single observation, your gut feeling, do you trust them or not to do this? And so um, they didn't like the no. They didn't like the yes, no. And so we sort of change it to not yet, saying that we're confident to our students you will get there, but you're not there yet, and just keep practicing. And then there's um, all of our forms have uh, sort of two narrative boxes at the end. This is an example of the neuro, uh, the neuro form. Um, and and uh, what you'll see here is that um, sort of same format. Um, there were two entrustment items that we had on the neuro form. Uh, kind of, do you, do you trust them as a reporter, and then do you trust them as an interpreter? Um, this is an example of our oral presentation form, and what we did with this form is that even though it's something that we thought we could use across all settings, there were times where we thought um, some questions should be optional because it's not necessarily applicable to that oral presentation. So if you're doing a follow-up or uh, visit type of oral presentation, that maybe you're not gonna have this long HPI with a chronologic story. And so we do have some optional items in there and that's how we handled keeping everything on one form. We also, at the end of our forms, many of them have kind of the complexity of decision-making uh, associated with that observation. Um, because when we looked at our common core objectives, sometimes we expect the students to be an interpreter for simple cases, for simple uh, patient problems, but not yet there for more complex problems. And so we thought that we at some point might use this in helping make decisions about how our students are doing and progressing throughout the year. So we had, um, so part two, sort of that first class was uh, June, the end of June, 1st of July, 2014. And so we had about two to three months um, after the making, making the decision to go to my progress, we were working on our checklist um, to sort of pilot this. And so we had, we had these two months to pilot. We piloted the oral presentation and our history and exam forms um, in a couple different settings. We did inpatient pediatrics, we did inpatient internal medicine, and we did ambulatory pediatrics. And that was, you know, um, by having buy-in for certain co coordinators as early adopters. Um, but then we really pretty quickly launched a program-wide implementation. And so our class of 185 students um, we sort of launched My Progress for all of our direct observation. And in addition to that, we used it for our simulation activities that we did in our sort of first week of our integrated clerkships where they're doing um, exams on an, a standardized patient or they're doing uh, procedural skills on a simulator. Uh, we used it for that as well. And the expectation was, I think, fairly light. These are four-month rings, and, and the expectation was that for each domain, history, physical, uh, et cetera, that they'd complete somewhere between one and three observations. We had more observation expectations for the history and the physical, less so for the, for the written and the oral presentation because those are things that hadn't previously been documented for us as a direct observation, so we were starting out small. And so this is just an example of our data. So we've had two classes go through part two to this point, and so looking from July 2014 when we launched program-wide to April 2016 when our second class sort of graduated part two, you can see we've done a lot of observations. And so um, for history, we've done over 1,750 observations between the comprehensive and the focused. And you can tell that most of them are in the focused category. Over 2,200 uh, documented observations of oral presentation, um, over 2,300 for physical exam, and over 1,000 for our written communication. And we can look and see that you know, there are certain forms, especially with the physical exam, because there's a lot of different combos of those forms that are are used more frequently than others. And so this is about 350 students and, and sort of quite a lot of observations that we can sort of capture and look at um, and, and see that are being done um, from a central aspect, whereas before we were having all of these sort of cardstock, you know, small cards floating around everywhere. 
Well, just to show you some of the data on how our students are doing in these, you know, it's interesting. They're, they're, they're doing pretty well on the individual items. This is our example of a focus history where I showed you these are the questions that are included. And for the most part, you know, there's at most 2% of a particular item um, that's not being done. Uh, you know, some of the more nuanced stuff like eliciting the patient perspective, but that's really a high performance. Um, and, and although, you know, there's about 5% of students that don't necessarily trust them after that single observation, I'm still sort of a relatively high, given that this includes the beginning of the year as well. This is an example of our oral presentation, and I think the numbers are relatively the same. There's really um, less than 2% on any given item, 2% of students and observations that um, the student missed a, a particular component, but there's up to about 5% where students are not yet ready to trust them. Um, and I would say that for our ring specific forms, this entrustment actually goes down. Um, so for like a detailed neurologic exam or the newborn exam, um, the entrustment actually will go down to about 60 or 70% of the observations where they're being trusted. Um, I think just because those are, those are more specialized. Um, those are more specialized skills that maybe they didn't have as much practice sort of throughout all of the clerkships. So just a few, um, John Mann's going to talk about sort of our challenges and lessons learned as a college, but kind of from my perspective uh, in part two, um, we changed a lot all at once. We went from different types of forms. We went from a very general two to three question mini CEX type form um, to longer sort of uh, item checklists. The checklists were between eight and 15 items for the most part um, that were supposed to be like quick low inference. But the forms changed and the technology changed. We went from cards to sort of these tablets and my progress. And so that was a lot of change all at once. Um, we got a lot of feedback, verbal feedback, that the forms were too long as we moved to these long checklists. Um, although as we're kind of revisiting that, uh, we changed and shortened them a little bit uh, midway through our first year. And as we are revisiting whether or not we should shorten them again, given our student performance is so high, our faculty really like having those, those details there. Um, because it is so quick and easy to do on my progress with the radio buttons um, to complete them. And, they, and, and so the feedback we've gotten from our faculty leaders is that as long as it's not impairing the sort of the formative, the verbal comments and, the, and um, sort of the feedback that you give to the student right there in the scenario, that's okay. They're okay with the length. So we go back and forth on that. But I think being mindful of the length is, is an important lesson. Um, and what we see, you know, our performance looks really high for those two forms I'll sh I've showed you. And for every form we've analyzed, the performance is similar. And what we've seen is that faculty are hesitant to say no, that they don't trust them, or to say no, that they didn't do this. And students, because they're so worried about grades and things, they'll challenge you. I've been challenged before when I said a student didn't accurately interpret the lab values. Because they'll say, I told you the labs. I'm like, yes, but you didn't accurately interpret them. And that's what's got you the no. And so they, they like to challenge us on those because they're expecting sort of, I think, perfect performance. And so getting them around the the growth behind it, the, the narrative part of the feedback, and I know there was a talk about that earlier, um, is, is something that I think we're still working on, emphasizing the formative not only to the students but also the faculty. And so as we perf um, sort of move forward with this in our third class, we're really looking at aggregating the performance of the students and trying to see if we can identify certain aspects um, on our checklist that are more or less likely to um, correlate with entrustment and higher performance than other uh, than other sort of items on the checklist. And really asking the, the integrated clerkships to use this more real time. So before, because this is all formative, um, the clerkships were just making sure they were getting done and not necessarily looking at the student performance to identify a student that's maybe struggling relative to the other students in a particular skill and, and sort of what the direct observation could tell us about that student real time. And so that's what we're looking to do this year is, is really get these detailed reports pulled on students before they meet with their faculty at six weeks in the ring and 10 weeks in the ring um, and, and use it as sort of part of their portfolio of their performance and not, and not really just something that needs to get done over here on the side. Um, and then it, it's brought up about, about faculty development, but you know, we made that video for the students and as we did that, we talked about uh, perhaps a video or some sort of media and faculty development um, about how to incorporate bedside teaching and direct observation because that's what students find really meaningful. How can you assess a student and observe them, um, but still do some teaching? And so um, it's, it's sort of a nuanced thing, especially with limited time um, with our clinical requirements. But, but that's what we're um, focusing on for this year. So 
I'd be happy to take any questions before John comes up. Yes. That's okay. The volume of responses that you have, which is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I think what you showed is a, a, a data example of what we've been hearing about great inflation and the quantitative ratings not being very useful mm -hmm. because you could argue, you know, you don't have a lot when you have 99% are meeting your expectations. Right. What is that telling you? Have you looked at the narrative uh, data? And if so, how do you do that when you have such a large volume? Mm -hmm. um, that's really the question. Yeah, no, I agree because, you know, we worried with these tablets that maybe they would, faculty would not put in a lot of comments, but there are, I would say, less than 5% that don't have comments or don't have, you know, just have like one or two word comments. So we're seeing a lot of great comments on those. And we expect that the students to, to look at them real time on their tablets, and we expect that there's a verbal conversation there, but really getting the sort of clerkships of the rings to look at them and use that. You know, this was sort of a, a data poll of two years worth of data, but if I think we stay on top of it sort of more real time, it's not as overwhelming. You know, this is all of our integrated clerkships combined. Do you have natural language processing, or have you thought about maybe using something like that to help yeah. analyze Yeah, that would be nice. I, I don't know where, if our research team is here, but I'll uh, put that bug in their ear. Kim, these are the students picking the time when they are being observed, or are the faculty picking the time when they are being observed? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, it's really student-driven in that it's on their devices, and, and they know the requirements better than the faculty, so we expect. But I know when I'm on service, I'll say tomorrow, make sure you have your tablets ready for, I'm going to do a, a direct observation on your oral presentation. And so I think there are some faculty that maybe drive this and don't give the faculty, you know, the student the choice, uh, but a lot of times the students are, are driving it. Yeah. 